come to you and as we have just sung we do we do love you lord we cannot we cannot express fully our love we know that we do not love you near as you deserve lord we know that our love is faltering and yet lord we love you and we thank you thank you that you have given yourself for our salvation we thank you that you have loved us You've drawn us to yourself, that you are continuing your work in us, that you will certainly complete it, that you'll bring us to be with you one day, and that we will dwell with you forever. We know that all of these gifts are ours because of your incredible love. So we cannot help but love you in return. And Lord, I do pray that we will be always abounding in that love, that we may be growing in our knowledge of you, knowledge of your will, the knowledge of your word, that we may be truly seeking to love you with all of our heart and our soul and our mind. And that, Lord, out of that love for you will flow love for others, that we will, will deeply love one another here, that we will care for one another, minister to one another, and encourage one another. And, Lord, we may... Truly serve each other selflessly and sacrificially because you have given yourself selflessly and sacrificially for them. And so, Lord, we thank you for that salvation. And we are mindful today of, of many on our hearts that are not saved. Some family members, some friends, Lord, that need you. We ask that you will do a mighty work that you will convict them, that today they will hear your word, whether it be here or some other place, that they will hear and believe and be saved. Father, we are mindful as well of the number that profess salvation but are not walking with you. And so, Lord, I pray that in your love you would, you would get, their, get hold of their hearts. 
Father, if it be through chastening that you will chasten them, that they may return to you, that they may bear the fruits of righteousness. Lord, I pray that you'll bring them quickly to the end of themselves, that they may, like that prodigal son, they may finally come to their senses and realize just how wasteful and destructive it is to live away from you. And so I pray that you will do a mighty work in those hearts. And Lord, as well, we are mindful of our missionaries. Again, I thank you for their service. I thank you for the good reports of the uh, uh, George that was saved in the, through the child's ministry. Lord, I thank you for the opportunities that you've opened up for, for each of them to proclaim you. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to strengthen them, continue to protect them. Lord, give them much fruit in that ministry. Lord, in each of their ministries, that they may see your hand moving, that they may exalt you, testifying of your goodness. I pray for Lisa particularly that you'll continue to give her healing, that, Lord, she may grow in strength, that she may be able to to return to Thailand quickly and be able to, to proclaim you there. Lord, that we may see souls saved through that ministry. But, Lord, here while she is in the States, that she may have opportunity and boldness to proclaim you that, Lord, you will give her that open door to the gospel, that she, ought, that she will proclaim you as she ought. And, Lord, that that will be true for each of us, that we may boldly proclaim you, that you will give us opportunities and wisdom to see them. Give us understanding to proclaim your gospel clearly and honestly, without apology, without change. That, Lord, you will use the members of this church to bring many to you. Lord, we ask that you will do a mighty work as we... Go out into the world this week. Lord, we pray that you'll do a mighty work in us as we gather today. That we may please you in all that we do. That we may be transformed by your word. That your Holy Spirit will work mightily in this place. And that it will be evident that you are our Lord and our Savior and our God. And so we pray all of these things in your precious name. Amen. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing on the morning of September 11th, 2001? I do. I was working in the yard of a lumber mill in Marquette, and the first hint that I had that something was going on was when a massive 747 flew overhead. It looked like it was just right there, like you could almost reach up and touch the landing gear. I soon heard that the terrorists had flown passenger planes into the World Trade Towers, and I, I watched some of the early news reports on the television set in the Kiln Control House. And that, and 9-11 is one of those dates in American history that is, is now ingrained in our collective memory. We have a number of days like that in, probably in your lifetime. I, I remember as well the day the Challenger exploded. Some of you may remember the day that President Reagan was shot or the day that Nixon resigned. If you were old enough to know what was going on, I'm sure you know and remember November 22nd, 1963, and the day that Kennedy was assassinated. And for the nation of Israel, one of the years that stands out in their collective history is 70 A.D., The letter to the Hebrews was written sometime in the mid to late 60s. Now, we don't know the exact date. I think it was written sometime after the persecution of Christians began in the mid 60s, and it definitely was written before 70 AD. And so it was written in this crucial time, I would say between 65 and 69 AD. And leading up to the year 70, The Jews in Judea had been in constant turmoil and rebellion against Rome. It had been building and building until finally it began to reach its peak. And at the same time, Judea, and particularly Jerusalem, was troubled with civil war. And so that they were, there were factions in Jerusalem fighting against themselves, and they had also had been for several years in open war against Rome, so that they were attacking the Roman soldiers and the Roman garrisons in and around the city. And so finally, Rome got fed up and sent an army under the command of Titus to squash the Jewish rebellion. During this civil strife in Jerusalem, there were attacks made against the temple. 
The attackers from below the Temple Mount would launch darts and javelins and other projectiles up into the temple precincts so that many priests were killed while they were going about the work of the ministry in the temple. And and the temple grounds were so dangerous that many worshipers bringing their offerings to the temple were also killed, and some of them killed just right before the very altar. So that priests and people, worshipers and officials, were slain by these random projectiles while offering their sacrifices to the Lord. And their devotion to worship is praiseworthy. The tragedy of all of that is that those men died doing something that was now unnecessary and worthless. When the Roman general Titus led his four legions against Jerusalem, it began a time of of great siege and intense trouble. And so that if you can picture Jerusalem with the Roman soldiers outside and the strife, the civil war continuing inside. And they began to suffer greatly. They began, they were, were slaughtering one another and then they began to starve. They resorted to all kinds of, of terrible things, including cannibalism. And those Jews who tried to escape the terrors of the city were captured and crucified by the Romans outside the city. So many were crucified that they ran out of room around the city walls to put up more crosses. And Titus then began to build a great wall all the way around Jerusalem. There was the city walls and he built a wall outside it to effectively imprison everyone. Which of course made the situation inside even more terrible, so that men began to now eat leather, old hay, pieces of clothing, and their need to find some sustenance. And so between the famine within and the Roman soldiers without, the city filled with the dead and the dying. After months of siege, the Romans finally gained access into Jerusalem. And by that time, many men had taken refuge in the temple itself. They used it as a citadel from which they were fighting the Roman army. And so soldiers set fire to the temple gates and it slowly spread into the temple itself over a period of days. And the temple began to burn. The Romans came in and they began to plunder as much of the temple's treasures as they could get hold of. And they killed anyone, any Jews that they found. The historian Josephus describes the scene. He says the misery itself was more terrible. The hill itself on which the temple stood was seething hot, full of fire on every part of it. The ground did nowhere appear visible for the dead bodies that lay on it. So the Roman soldiers were walking across corpses in their plunders of the temple. And when it was all over, the temple of Jerusalem had been destroyed. And since 70 AD, the Jews have had no temple. As I said earlier, the book of Hebrews was written just a few years before the destruction of the temple. It was written during the final buildup of strife. And this is important for many reasons. One of them is that these Christians in Jerusalem received this letter during the time of great unrest. They received this letter when everything that made the Jews who they were was was about to be destroyed. And all that they held dearest was about to crumble. So this letter to the Hebrew Christians in Jerusalem was written to them on the very eve of the destruction of Judaism, the worship of Judaism. Hebrews chapter 9 opens with a brief description of the tabernacle and its furniture. And I say it's brief because it's several verses long, but The 10 of the last 15 chapters in Exodus 
are devoted to a detailed description of the tabernacle. Hundreds of verses in the Old Testament describe the tabernacle. So it's very brief. It's only seven verses here. So Hebrews 9, verse 1, it says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick in the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over at the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of his people. The tabernacle was the first building for the worship of God in Israel. It was the place where sacrifices were made to God. It was the place where God's presence resided in Israel. So that from the time of Mount Sinai and the giving of the law until the reign of Solomon, the tabernacle was the center of Jewish worship in Israel. For 400 years, the dwelling place of God was the tabernacle. And this tabernacle, it was a portable building. It was made for and during the wilderness wanderings. But, and it was essentially a large but incredibly nice tent. And Hebrews 9 begins by describing this tabernacle. The floor plan of the tabernacle was the same as the floor plan of later temples. The building was divided into two chambers, the outer chamber and then the the inner one, the back one. The outer chamber was called the holy place, it's called here in Hebrews 9, the sanctuary. It was 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. Inside that outer room, that sanctuary, were three pieces of furniture. As the priest walked in, on his left was the golden candlestick. And and don't think of of it like a a candlestick today where you have wax candles sticking up. It's more like a lamp stand uh, is what it was. It had bowls on top that were filled with olive oil and they would burn that. So that this candlestick, this lamp stand, was the only source of light in the holy place. On the other side, across from it, on the priest's right, was a small table. And it was about three feet wide and 18 inches deep. On it were placed 12 loaves of bread every Sabbath day. And then directly in front of the priest on the back wall was a small altar. It was 18 inches on a side. So I mean really just not big at all. It stood about three foot tall. That was known as the altar of incense. And on this altar of incense, the priest burned incense to the Lord every morning. The most important day of the Jewish New Year was the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, the, pre, the high priest would go into this closed-off back room, the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, or as Hebrews 9 calls it, the holiest of all. This place uh, where, where the ark and the chair and the mercy seat were but before he would go in there he would take coals from the altar of burnt offering outside the tabernacle and he would bring those coals in and, and bring in also a handful of incense he would place the coals from the altar of burnt offering on the altar of incense and then he would would put the incense on those burning coals so that the cloud of incense would fill the tabernacle and it would would fill both the holy place and the holy of holies. And Leviticus 16 says why the priest burned incense on the day of atonement. It says, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. So the high priest put this incense 
to cover the mercy seat so that he would survive when he went into the Holy of Holies. Because after offering the incense, the holy, the high priest would take blood from a young bull into the Holy of Holies. And he would sprinkle it in front of the mercy seat. The mercy seat was the covering of the Ark of the Covenant. You can kind of see it on the picture there. The, oops, the, um, the an, vague figures there. It was, uh, it, just two angels, two cherubim, made out of gold that stretched their wings out towards each other and they acted as the covering for the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was just a small wooden box. It was only two feet wide and four foot long. It was a trunk. It was how I would call it today. And inside that Ark were three things. A little pot of manna and Aaron's rod, which budded when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram rebelled against Moses and Aaron. And when God showed Israel that Aaron was his anointed high priest. If you're not familiar with the story, it's, it's an in, interesting account. Because God, when Korah and Dathan and Abiram rebelled, God told Israel, I will show you who is my anointed priest. And he instructed them to have the heads of each of the twelve tribes to come to the tabernacle and to bring a stick. Aaron, as the head of the tribe of Levi, came to the tabernacle and brought a stick with him, a rod. They placed them in the tabernacle and left. And God told them, the the one who I have anointed, his rod will bud. It will start growing. And so the next morning they came and they looked and Aaron's rod had not only budded, it had blossomed and even begun to produce almonds. So that that rod that testified that Aaron was the chosen priest of God, the pot of manna, and the two stone tablets on which were carved the Ten Commandments. Those were in this ark called the Ark of the Covenant. It was the symbol of the covenant between Israel and God. In that ark was the constant reminder, the terms of the covenant were placed. And there it sat, always in the presence of God. Because on top of this mercy seat, where the angel wings stretched out over the ark, rested the presence of God. So that in Israel, the visible presence of God dwelled in the holy of holies. And once a year, the high priest of Israel went into that Holy of Holies to make atonement for the sin of Israel. So the author of Hebrews tells us and reminds these believers of this tabernacle. And he does so for a number of reasons. One of them, verse 6, we see him point out again the continual nature of the priest's work, that they went always into the first tabernacle, the sanctuary, the holy place, accomplishing the service of God. Every single day, the priest of Israel went in the holy place. They, they had rituals and duties they were required to perform. Every morning, they trimmed the wicks and they refilled the lamps. Every morning, the priest put fresh incense on the altar of incense. Every year, the high priest went into that Holy of Holies. Every Sabbath day, they replaced the showbread. They were constantly in and out of that holy place. Their their works were never done because the work of atonement was never completed. The high priest had to go back next year. You make atonement again. And the next year, and make atonement again because atonement was never finished. And this passage also tells us, the end of verse 6, that the priest did all of this to accomplish the service of God. I want to stress this because I, I think sometimes we, we, we are tempted to look back at the Old Testament and just think, man, it doesn't matter anymore. Or it was, it was, it, it's something that we, we don't have to think about. It's, it's trivial. It's unimportant. That's not what scripture says about it. And part of what he says here, as he is showing 
the superiority of Jesus, he highlights the importance of the tabernacle. And as we're talking about Christ and the sacrifices of Christ, I think it's helpful for us to remember that we elevate the importance of the work of Christ not by diminishing the importance of the Old Testament, but by elevating it. Because as we show the significance of the Old Testament rituals, we show that Christ is so much greater. And that's what he is saying here, is in all of these things, these rituals, these offerings, the furnishings were directly appointed by God. This was not a man-made religion. This worship was not a reflection of the culture of Israel. It was a worship that shaped and transformed the culture of Israel. It was a worship given by God. So that he gave detailed instructions about every single part of it. So that as you go through your read through the Bible in a year plan, you reach the end of Exodus. And you start thinking, why are there so many details here? And then why does it repeat it all word for word? Because all of this is given by God in particular. He didn't just say, make me a tabernacle, make it kind of like this. He said, make me a tabernacle and you make it exactly like this. For example, the the, the lampstand that I, I mentioned. It was to have, God defined, it was to have three branches on each side of the central post. And that each branch, the, the, the head of it, was to be shaped like an almond. Now, I don't mean almond-shaped in the sense it was kind of oval and pointy at one end. I mean almond-shaped that it was to be made like an actual almond flower with bud and flowers and everything. It was actually a very elaborate structure. The entire candelabra was to be made out of one piece of beaten gold. So they couldn't make a a form out of sand or some more pliable thing and then just pour melted gold into it. They had to hand form, hand, hand sculpt this entire candelabra. And if he messed up on an arm, he didn't get to kind of slice it off and put another one on and just weld it together nice. It had to be one whole piece. All of this was the command of God. And he ends this particular section by telling Moses to take care to make sure everything was made exactly according to the instructions that God had given. Which, by the way, is why at the end of Exodus it repeats exactly everything God had said. Because they're they're basically the testifying. God said, do this, 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 and this. And we did this, 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 and this. The same detail that God gave is the same detail in which we obeyed. And, and we take that, not, the, the candlestick is just an illustration. Because every single part of the tabernacle worship was given by God. Every detail of the tabernacle's construction, building, taking down, moving, setting back up again, every single part was described and defined for them by God. Every article of the priest's clothing were made according to the pattern given by God. Every single act of worship, from waving the grain to sprinkling of the blood and everything else, all of it was given by God in specific detail. And what this did, in part, it made for a glorious ritual. Now, I know that, that some of us are uncultured louts who avoid anything more ceremonial than going through the McDonald's drive through And I include myself in that. In fact, I find the drive through a bit tedious and cumbersome. So, I, I, I recognize that some of us have a hard time appreciating the beauty, the wonder of these rituals. But it was there. It was an incredible display. And they did something. And I think there's something valuable for us to note. As the rituals of Israel offered something that our, 
our highly informal church services fail to do. These many ceremonies showed the seriousness, the awesomeness of approaching God. I remember when I was in high school and even younger, we'd do these various programs at school. I went to a Christian school and so we did these things with the school and with the church. And inevitably, you would have to march down the aisle. And that drove me crazy and got me fussed at more times than anything because I wanted to walk down the aisle. And so I would start at the back and get to the front. There, I walked down the aisle. No, you had to walk. It was just slow and ponderous. Take your time. Even when we got married, I think the wedding coordinator was saying, slow down. Because it's to be a seriousness was what they were trying to tell me. Um, There's a, a, a sobriety. What you're doing matters. I don't actually think it matters when you're graduating, but it does matter when you come to God. It does matter how we approach Him. And these ceremonies, even though we're not under them, I'm not at all arguing that we go back to them. They showed that when we come to God, we are engaging the Creator of all. We are engaging one who demands and deserves all of our respect. Now, we take it seriously. It's not some trivial thing. It is a a matter of great concern. And most importantly, all of these rituals, they showed that man can only come to God according to the way given by him. The Old Testament, especially the Mosaic Law, but... The Old Testament in general shows us that God defines the way in which we approach Him. God is gracious. He invites us to come to Him. And in His grace provides the way for us to do so. But what that also means is man does not get to decide how he wants to come to God. We start with Cain. And we see in the Old Testament all of those who tried it their own way. And they suffered dire consequences. In Israel, shortly after the building of the tabernacle, God lit the fire on the altar of burnt offering. He lit it with fire from heaven. And that was the only fire that was to be used in the temple or in the tabernacle. But two of of, of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they decided to take their own fire. We don't aren't told where they got it from, but they didn't get it from the burnt offering, the altar of burnt offerings. They took their own fire and brought it and offered incense up to God. And God did not have respect unto their offering. Instead, fire fell from heaven and consumed them. And God said. You come the way I have provided. You only come in the way that I have provided. He does not accept any other way. God does not give points for sincerity or devotion. He does not give us points for us about, for us for being serious about religion. He only accepts that which He provides as the means to come to Him. And this tabernacle was the glorious means by which Israel could approach God. It was the glorious place where God's presence rested. So that Israel knew God dwelled among them. They could point to the tabernacle as the place where their God rested. And they could say, God lives there. We saw Him descend from heaven in glory and fill His tabernacle. No other place on earth, no other nation ever had that privilege. Only Israel was a place where God dwelled. And it is that presence of God that made the tabernacle glorious. It's that presence of God that made the temple glorious. I mean, as, as beautiful as this tabernacle is, it's still a tent. 
It's still made out of wood and animal skins. It was about one-fifth the size of our church building. Our church building is not really very big. It was as long as our building is wide. And it's a couple feet wider than, than one of these pews. So the tabernacle would fit easily inside our building. It would stretch from that window to the back wall there where the cross is. That's how long it was. Again, 15 foot wide. So it would take up less than or a little more than a third of this end of the building. That's it. It was impressive. But judged by today's standards, it wasn't that impressive. I don't think any of us have ever said, boy, badger skin is such a nice material. That's what the tabernacle was covered in. The temple of Solomon, that, that was a different story. Solomon's temple was magnificent. It was a billion dollar structure covered in gold. It was, it was so great that kings and queens traveled to Jerusalem to see the temple. Hundreds of years after Solomon's temple was built, it was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then 70 years later, when the Jews were permitted to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild their temple, it was nothing. It was nothing compared to the glory of Solomon's temple. Really, by, Solomon, by comparison, it was a plywood shack built out of cobbled together scraps. It, it was seemingly so insignificant that the old timers who remembered as a kid seeing Solomon's temple... When they looked at this, this tacked together temple that they were building, they wept. And they said, it's nothing. It's not important. It was more blight than beauty. And God spoke to the prophet and through the prophet Haggai. He told those weeping elders that the glory of the temple was not in its structure but in who was being worshipped. In Haggai 2, God tells them of His glory. That He is glorious beyond our comprehension. He is the God who rules all nations. He is the King who possesses all wealth. He is the Creator who reigns over all creatures. And it is His glory that makes the tabernacle or the temples glorious. The the craftsmanship is breathtaking. It it is absolutely astounding what went into making that tabernacle and later the temple. But all of their beauty, all of their magnificence does not compare. It is dwarfed and overshadowed by the glory of God. Why bring all that up? We're not not embarking on a building program. So why don't I mention all of this? Because we're actually tempted to think much the same as they did. We are tempted to think that the quality of the building or the excellence of the production make our worship better. We are tempted to think if we have talented enough musicians, an appealing enough pastor, a big enough building, a slick enough website, or full enough children's ministry, then we must be really worshiping God. We are inclined to think like those old men in Jerusalem who bemoaned the appearance. We think that if our senses are stirred, then we worship. We confuse the effects that the, our, our senses have on our emotions. Because we absolutely are stirred by what we see and hear and smell and taste. They affect us. But sometimes we think that effect is worship. And true worship happens when we come into the presence of God. True worship happens can happen in a grand cathedral with vaulted ceilings and 500-year-old stained glass. It can happen in a tiny window or a tiny apartment with the windows 
blacked out and a watchman outside the door to give warning in case the police come. True worship can happen in a jungle clearing by a river bank, in a penthouse, a half-empty mall, a crumbling hundred-year-old building, or a brand-new multi-million dollar complex. The place is, and the performance, I'm not even going to get into that, all of those things are secondary. What matters is the presence. If God is present, if God is lifted up, if God's word is proclaimed, if God's people are gathering together to provoke one another to love God and to love others, if, if God is the centerpiece, if God is the one who grips our hearts and our minds, then worship happens. When we recognize and truly recognize the worth of the one who saved us, then worship happens. And the tabernacle was glorious because of the God who dwelt there. And our worship should be as glorious because we worship the same God And even more marvelous, marvelously, we have his presence dwelling within us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, The ministry engraved on stones, that's the law, was glorious. This old covenant was so glorious that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he had to put a veil on his face. His face was glowing from long exposure to the presence of God. That law is glorious. It is holy. It is good. It was given by God himself, first written by his own hand on stone tablets. Again, no other people can ever say they have God's presence in their midst and God's laws written by his own hands. No other people could say they were worshiping exactly as their God prescribed. No other people could say the place of worship, the tools of worship, or the rituals of worship were given in clear and particular detail by their God. This old covenant was a glorious God-given covenant. But like the radiance on Moses' face, the old covenant was going to fade away. Hebrews 8, verse 13. It says, in, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Hebrews eight thirteen was saying the old covenant was getting old. It was ready to disappear. It was about to fade from sight. And within a few years of the writing of this letter, God made it impossible to keep the Old Covenant. God took away the place of Jewish worship. The Romans tore the temple down. Nothing of it remains. Still, nothing of it remains. The only piece that was left is known today as the Wailing Wall. It was not a piece of the temple. It's a piece of the old retaining walls that held up the plateau on which the temple was built. Nothing else remains of that glorious temple that Herod had built. Nothing at all remains of Solomon's temple or the tabernacle. The furniture has been lost to humanity. The candlestick, basins, and altars are gone. The mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant is gone. So that Israel has no temple, no altar, no Ark, And no mercy seat. They have no sacrifice. And no hope of keeping God's law. The old covenant is no more. That old covenant that has faded away was glorious. How much more glorious is the ministry of the new covenant? I think the tabernacle helps us because they were, they were marvelous. They were majestic. I think we can picture them 
I, I really, I, I struggle to picture the glory of Christ's ongoing ministry for us. I mean, I know the truths, but I, I struggle to, to see them in my mind, much less really grasp them in my heart. The, the tabernacle gives us something we can, we can see somewhat. We can understand somewhat. And if it is, that is glorious, and it is, how much more glorious is that which replaces it? How much more glorious is this work of Christ? Why would anybody want to go back to that which has been replaced. Why would anybody want to turn back to those old legalisms? I mean, how many of you would go would give up your cell phone to go back to the days of the party line phones? Now, I know some days we probably all think we would, but really get down to it, I don't know that any of us would be glad to give up that phone and just be severely restricted. How many of you would trade your trade your car? For a horse and bucky. Again, all of us probably think at times we would. We all grumble about the problems of modern technology, but I don't think we would seriously want to go back and live like they did 150 years ago. The technological advancements are a poor illustration of the superiority of Jesus over the old covenant. So why go back? Why go back to rules and regulations that cannot save. And I don't mean we don't live under His commands. Then why go back to those things as a means of salvation or means of keeping salvation? What we are doing, if we turn back to that in any way, is we're acting like Nadab and Abihu. We're saying, I've got my own fire. I'm going to bring this to God and expect Him to accept it. I've got my own good deeds. I'm going to bring them to God and expect Him to accept them. I've got my own faithfulness. I'm going to bring it to God and expect Him to accept it. And God re- receives that as willingly as He received the offerings of Nadab and Abihu and the offerings of Cain. He utterly rejects them. And these things, as scriptures have so powerfully and clearly said, can never save. We have in Jesus one who fully saves. He is the way provided by God. And he is the full salvation so that there is nothing left to be forgiven. And God offers that freely to us. The glorious gospel of Jesus promises eternal life and full forgiveness. It says, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. That you can be certain that we have eternal life. Because it is all done by Jesus. Legalism says, do. The gospel says, done. If you've not received him, will you? Will you receive his forgiveness? And I, I have to stop here, but I want to conclude with one word to, the, to you that are saved. Give serious thought, earnest meditation to the greatness of Jesus. His salvation is greater than all other hopes or methods of salvation. Because He is greater. He is greater than all these other Gospels that are not Gospels. Because He Himself and His own person is far greater. He is deserving of our constant worship because He is greatest. Because He is our full salvation. What the tabernacle could never do, He did. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that as we continue to meditate on your Son, that Lord, we will marvel, we will rejoice, that we will worship because of what you have done in us and through us by your power. Lord, we ask that as we go about our lives and work this week, that we will continue 
to meditate on these truths. And Lord, that we will faithfully proclaim them to the lost. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen.